So here you have the first slide regarding anti-fascist graphic art in US uh, newspapers. And uh, this is also in the University of Houston. And uh, the title of the project is Fighting Fascist uh, Spain, the exhibits. It is a collection of exhibits, particularly from primary sources, but they are contextualized, as I will explain to you now. You have the code if you want to scan it, and there you will go directly into the project. Today, what I'm going to mention uh, has, uh, well, to give you some context, it will talk about the newspapers. So these are anti-fascist newspapers in the US, both in Spanish and in English. They are bilingual. They are written by Latinos, but uh, it, it was open to anyone who was against uh, fascism. And I have collected uh, particularly the written press, graphic arts, photographies and also the communities, because you will see the importance of how these communities helped these political and cultural activism. And then I would like to give you some historical context, particularly the Spanish migration, because we know more about the Latin, Latin migration and not so much the Spanish one, but here in the US, there are cultural organizations and political organizations, particularly workers' organizations. And these uh, workers were involved politically because they not only left Spain because uh, they found better jobs, but also they were escaping political conflicts. And you tend to see or think when we talk about anti-fascism that we look at the civil war, but they were escaping fascism from before that. Particularly, we know that uh, Spanish fascism, uh, it, it was uh, the uh, Rif War, the colonial wars, and then the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera, who was the first one that introduced uh, fascism in Spain. And uh, there was the second republic from 31 to 36, and there new opportunities open for democracy in Spain for women and workers. So there was an in increasing well, I'm trying to speak slower because I know there is interpretation. So also there was an increasing competitiveness between the democratic forces and the fascist forces. And this led to the coup and the civil war, which lasted three years. And then the dictatorship was, uh, of Franco until 1975. So here in the US, these organizations or cultural associations of workers joined in in what was called the Confederated Hispanic Societies. And they were created eight days after the coup. So you see now that the response was very strong and quick. Here you have the card that they used to be part of these organizations. Here in the map, you can see where these organizations were concentrated. The objectives were to help refugees because as you know, half a million of people escaped Spain and uh, the, the prisoners also during the war and during the Franco era wanted to publish and educate uh, the US about the fascist terror in Spain and also preserve the history of the working class because in Spain it was being destroyed. So they did that through direct actions here in the US with pickets to those stores that sold products from Spain or that uh, support Franco, also boycotts, protest in front of the consulates and theaters. And they also did solidarity campaigns 
And they did that through educational events as well as fundraising events in order to take all this money and help the refugees to get settled in Mexico and Venezuela, where they were given visas. Thanks to them, then these refugees found a place to go. And also there were radio programs and uh, and also where I'm taking this uh, uh, information, there is the publication of the Frente Popular and España Libre, which uh, lasted from the beginning of the war to until the end of the uh, Franco era. And it has uh, eight to 12 pages and about 4,000 copies that are distributed in the US, but also entered clandestinely in Spain. And they were distributed also into any country where there was interest in this topic. And also it was uh, distributed free of charge uh, to the refugees as a service to them. There were other newspapers, for example, the Confederadas, which uh, uh, co collaborated with Periodico Iberica, published in New York. And these two newspapers uh, were published in New York. And this, uh, newspaper was differently financed. It was not from the basis, as I was explaining with uh, regarding the Confederadas. Crane was uh, the uh, mate of Victoria Kane financed uh, this newspaper and it had, uh, uh, they were published from 53 to 74 in English and they collaborated with Las Confederadas in uh, different ways, which I can explain in further detail if you're interested. So this is the project that I commented in the beginning as an introduction. Today, I am going to focus on graphic art. I have uh, recovered many artists and also there are artists that are anonymous. And this is one of the projects in which I'm working now, trying to identify who were these artists, even though in these base projects, the authorship was not so important. Everybody contributed to them and may, maybe one drawing could be a sporadic uh, contribution, a single one. So this recovery, as I said, was in the recovery project here at Houston University in the, the digital collections of the university. So I wanted to show you some examples of this uh, graphic art. Since we have uh, 15 minutes, well, I have selected two or three so that you uh, have an idea of how graphic arts uh, work in those uh, uh, newspapers. What was important was the cover, of course, and one of the values of these uh, newspapers was to commemorate uh, July 19th. Why is this date important? Because uh, this is the working class history. We know that on July 18th, Franco, together with other members, military members, they uh, defeated or uh, ousted the democratic government. So on the 19th, which is the next day, the people went to the streets to defend the Republic, to defend democracy. And this lasted for three years with very little international help. So for working organizations, workers organizations in the US, it was important to commemorate the, on July 19th to remember the activism of the people. Here you can see a drawing where we see two militiamen. They are in the trenches on the trench on this uh, day in the calendar. And uh, we see that it is Mariana with uh, the Phrygian cap, which is the symbol of freedom. And uh, this happened every year until 1977, where they started uh, to have uh, democratic elections in Spain. And the newspaper said that it was going to close because they had obtained what they were looking for. And we also see that another use of graphics arts despite remembering the value of the civil society in a democracy, 
was the collection of funds. Here we see an announcement to, to do a picnic where there were uh, uh, rides, uh, dancing in, in Staten Island. And to foster people going, we they, they drew a militiaman, but this militiaman compared to the viral representation that we see in the war and also in the Spanish Civil War. Here we represent him as a father, a loving father that must abandon his family to defend freedom and democracy for all. So we see that the artists drew the weapons of the resistance, which was solidarity, inter effective interdependence and their bodies because really they didn't have any more resources to fight against fascism. And here I uh, quote Butler where she uh, talks about the importance of popular assemblies to defend democracies or the values and that uh, they consider that defend them as a community. What I've mentioned so far are sort of anonymous because I have not identified them, but here we have Bartoli, who was a great artist and uh, gave his drawings to the Confederate societies, but also the newspaper Iberica. And here we see in 1960 how it is explains what is uh, fascism to the US people. This, this uh, newspaper was in English and you see how Bartoli tries to denounce and explain one of the pillars of Spanish fascism, the cult uh, for the single leader, which also happened in other fascism fascist governments. And we have the, the slogan of the Spanish fascism, Arriba España, and this was uh, delivered by a member of the fascist party. But the drawing shows a monstrous Nazi soldier is mocking the Spanish fascism because uh, we see a very tiny dictatorship, a, a tiny Franco that can only give, shake his hand to Nazism because it has the church, the oligarchy, the army, and the military, and the phalangist that support them because if not, uh, the people could have not uh, revoked them. We will see another drawing of uh, Bartoli. I have recovered many of his uh, uh, show drawings. De los mitos del fascismo español era el imperio. Entonces, lo que hace Bartoli es poner a Franco como estatua. Hay una estatua de Colón en Barcelona. Entonces, pone a Franco como a si fuera a of Colón, Columbus, en Barcelona. And he wants to recover the Catholic Empire, but he says that the workers can uh, denounce. Uh, these um, ideas going out on the streets to protest. This was 1958, to go to the streets uh, on a strike. In the Franken um, dictatorship was extremely uh, dangerous. But the anti-fascist newspapers were constantly, uh, we've had various decades of this, that reminded the people that they had the strength of their bodies if they went out on the streets. Therefore, we have some images if we have time for questions. But uh, what I would like to uh, transmit to you is that a graphic art that was published in Spanish and also in English here in the United States, it denounced the fascist terror from various decades, from 1930 to 1970, when the United States, uh, this was uh, alternative press, right? 
as I've been explaining, Frente Popular, Iberica, España Libre, the mainstream newspaper, notwithstanding, promoted Francisco Franco like an ally and as a savior of Catholicism, which is why these, uh, these uh, newspapers were being supervised by the FBI and uh, overseen by the FBI because people that were undergoing fascism because it risked their lives also in the United States and also to be surveilled and their freedom of, uh, of movement was also curtailed here in the United States. I tried to explain that it was that Spanish fascism that lasted for so long because violence against the population was during the entire period of Franco. And it had these ideas of resurgence of a imperialist past and a present in France, in a fascist present. What I wanted to conclude before I finish this graphic art that I'm recovering the uh, fascist Spain, uh, fighting fascist Spain, the exhibits, as you have seen on the map that I showed you, there is a network, a uh, workers uh, network of, uh, of uh, Latin America. And they participated in these organizations. There were Italians also, but normally in these organizations, political organizations, there were more there was a larger variety of members and this culture wasn't only a worker but was also uh, filled with journalism they had they knew how to publish uh, these um, newspapers for a long time and this is an effort of the spanish exiled and the latin american um, union that gathered against fascism and with this, I have concluded. If you have any questions, please set them forth. Thank you very much, Monse. We will leave them for the end. Since uh, Gabi is here and we had her in order, let's go with Gabi. Gabi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I am here. Hello, how nice, uh, very nice to meet all of you and I'm sorry uh, for the delay. The topic I am going to share with you today is linked to the methodologies of decolonial methods in digital humanities. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, the examples of the projects that we have been uh, developing from the University of Houston. I will share my screen now. I have to, I am a eyeglass uh, user. So I have to make sure that I have all the images correctly. All right, so these decolonial methods and digital humanities um, I begin from the proposal from my enunciation is that from the theory of Emma Perez, she published a book where she talks about the colonial, the decolonial imaginary, which is a rupturing space, the alternative to what is uh, written in the histories. I believe that decolonial imaginary is the time lag between the colonial and post-colonial era, that interstitial space where differential politics and social dilemmas are negotiated. The historian political project then is therefore um, the work that we're doing uh, is a right of the story that decolonizes otherness. Uh, here's some uh, background of us. We are an editorial that uh, comes about uh, from a proposal that is political, social, and racial in nature to create a space through this magazine that's called Chicano Riveña that you can see it on the this corner, which proposes to create a physical 
space where you can join the voices of those that are um, supporting civil rights in the United States and the East and the West. We have the New York Kenyans and the Chicanos that are struggling for their identity, for their civil rights, for their social rights in the United States. And this magazine comes to create this space where they can publish and locate and uh, pero también una, la, la, lo que estaban escribiendo de, en términos... and, and all those things that are they're writing in a critical fashion for scholars that have already been uh, entered the university and that are writing from a perspective that is academic and scholarly in nature, what is in uh, literature, uh, the, the writers that are producing material from the United States and that are working to uh, these publication many a times on writers, as you can see on the left, Viera or Hinojoso, uh, or on a topic uh, linked to the United States was not considered dignified to be utilized to receive the permanence in the United States. For example, it wasn't uh, dignified enough to be published in a magazine in the United States. So the Chicano Riqueña comes about uh, where you start validating all that literature. The magazine uh, becomes later, uh, the name has changed into America's Review, not only to incorporate the views of the Chicanos and the New Riqueños, but also other voices of Latin Americans that are living in the United States. And also uh, the uh, need to create an editorial which is a uh, public press that uh, it's still an um, um, NGO. And I can tell you that here we have an, uh, some civil rights uh, pioneers of uh, Latin American uh, literature, but also a sector for children, which is called uh, Piñata Books. They start publishing material and uh, literature which Latin American children can see themselves reflected in, under their circumstances, linguistically, social, and so on. These are simply just to, so that you can understand what we are doing uh, uh, as um, digital humanities in reclaiming the literary, uh, literary legacy of US and Hispanic heritage. Villarroel and myself, we have created the digital humanities from the University of Houston to create a space of development where we can provide support and training for colleagues uh, in developing a digital humanity projects using material from the uh, recovery archives of the United States, uh, of the uh, Latin American uh, legacy and also the opportunities and space uh, for public uh, for publication of digital work, which is uh, interdisciplinary in nature and also a virtual community um, space where la Latino, Latin American and knowledge and projects can be shared and establish a virtual hub where all the production of uh, the work of uh, digital humanities are being carried out from the United States for uh, a community uh, that is bilingual, multicultural amongst all, amongst others. We have also built better practices where our objective is to think about this perspective from the decolonialization standpoint. How can we build communities through establishing intergenerational and uh, relationships amongst different uh, publics. Also the creation of social academies of the senior citizens, both as scholars and as members of communities that maintain a great deal of material, both at home, in personal files, or files that have been uh, donated to a museum or a library, but they are still um, actively involved and want to be involved in these projects that we're developing. And we put them as collaborators with students at the university, whether undergraduates, 
or graduates. We also have students with high school students in primary school levels also. We also how to con we see how to create community, social communities, national and international. Uh, this is our proposal is to think how we can develop all these different strategies that allow us to create a decolonizing um, uh, processes that through digital humanities were stepping away a little bit from the university environment. And we understand that theory and projects and knowledge is being developed from various locations it doesn't you don't need to be an academic to do this kind of work and also there are protocols that need to uh, that refer to access of knowledge and uh, we want to ensure that they can be seen and worked on and uh, made visible uh, and that there is a responsibility uh, ethnic and ethical when dealing with these files when we're talking about our community, the communities that participate, all these files uh, provide information about these projects. These are active members of the community and creators and co-creators of this uh, product. There are scholars and researchers that have arrived and, and have allowed us to discover a great deal of this material. Uh, our idea is always to think that this analysis that was done, that the, the work that was created wasn't enough. In fact, it's on the contrary, it's work that we are expanding and supporting to expand. And we want to continue cultivating spaces of respect in the production of knowledge. As I said, this is knowledge that is under development in all from all different corners of as we as we come close to the final projects and the final uh, visualization. What is very important where we obtained a great deal of information uh, to carry out these digital work is through uh, recovery, the uh, recovering of the US Hispanic lit uh, literary heritage. This is a program that seeks to um, disseminate the uh, information of Hispanic presence um, from, uh, sorry, from the 15th century, sorry, 50, 17th century, all the way to 1980. The material is digitalized. It is, um, there is a great deal of metadata that's uh, generated. We have read the newspapers extracting literature from these newspapers and it has created a metadata uh, by item you can see here the kind of um, metadata work the program of recovering uh, hispanic her heritage there is approximately 2000 newspapers um, in spanish in uh, public art, there is a 1500 recovery. Here's uh, some examples that were published in the United States in 1811 and 8,000, 1814 in uh, the Mississippi and the Gazette and also in French. And there was La Belle, for example, was published in French, in English and in Spanish at the same time and they published all three languages at the same time. There are feminist um, newspapers, uh, there are anarchists, I'm going to uh, newspapers. You can see all the metadata that we have been working on when we created. And this is all to give you an idea of how the process, the production process and the accumulation of these files is always a decolonial uh, proposal. I'm going to go back a little to the metadata. When we carry, when we see the headings in the libraries of, of the Library of Congress, we realize that um, great deal of this information is highly limited. Uh, it limits. It's either descriptions that are mistaken of the Latin American community. So we have to enter and correct and rethink. 
and see how some of these descriptions can be made. Uh, we offer, we not only work with the headings in English, we also work with uh, headings in Spanish. And then we offer, of course, a list of, of keywords that will allow us to support and ensure that these materials can be found, can be easily discovered. One of the examples I wanted to talk to you about is this file that's called uh, The Rebel uh, by Leonor Villagas de Magnon. This is a woman that participates in the Mexican Revolution. Uh, she uh, relates her story in her biography in Spanish, then it's translated into English. When she wants to publish it, she's not able to do it while alive. It goes to her daughter, then her daughter wants to publish it, and that's not, uh, she's not able. So there is a trunk full of all this material. Then her granddaughter and one of our researchers in the program of recovery finds in a newspaper, there's an, a uh, note where this novel, um, there's a story about this, uh, the rebel story was written. Uh, the researcher goes to um, Holland because it is in Holland for some reason uh, that there was uh, inf interest to uh, collect the anarchist newspapers. Uh, she goes there and she realizes that all oh, she learns about the rest of the news, but what was known is a piece of that news. And then she realizes that, or discovers rather, that this trunk uh, where the manuscript is kept is in the hands of the granddaughter of Leonard, and, and she lives in Houston now. And so the trunk arrives in our hands. We receive the manuscript, we receive the trunk with all the historical material of Leonor Villegas de Magnon, uh, which creates a network, uh, she creates a, a white cross a nurse and follows the revolutionaries that come to the United States. And she spends her entire fortune in following these revolutionaries. This is a woman that had a, a money and hires a photographer that comes with her. As you can see, uh, the picture on this image, this is one of the moments in that she lived. Uh, this file is very valuable, which comments the history in first hand uh, of the name and last name of a soldier that participates in the revolution. We have many stories of these soldiers, but not a single one with a name and a last name. And here we have a story that tells us firsthand of a woman of what happened, uh, which is striking. And uh, the rebel, uh, through thinking of these decolonizing system, uh, the National Institute of Anthropology of Mexico, we returned this file to Mexico and we collaborated to print the version in Spanish so that this story will not only stay in the United States, but it also reaches Mexico. And through the program of digital humanities, we were able to set forth a third publication, which is through this uh, Umeca uh, to distribute the material no longer in print, but rather in virtual spaces where we're able uh, to set forth the story, not only for it to remain in an academic environment, but rather enter the classrooms and schools. This collection is it being um, headed by a school of a community college in Houston. And it is uh, this uh, bilingual exhibition, it's in English and in Spanish. It is an example of how we are working uh, by utilizing all the strategies that we have, not only to publish stories from the standpoint of a woman and subjects that were not incorporated in a in a national discourses, literary um, forms, Latins, women uh, do not have a voice or presence. And we're always uh, seeking to use the tools that are available to us to distribute this material uh, and to ensure that it reaches more people. 
I will skip now to, I just wanted to leave enough time to, to the rest of the team. We have all the projects illustrated here in uh, artepublicopress.com slash projects. This is where we have all the virtual exhibits, uh, publications through Manifold, maps, timelines, Twitter uh, bugs, etc. The idea is to create and visualize and make the Latin files and background information uh, that exists from the United States where our community um, does not have a visibility or access to this visibility, which is concrete and contextualized. The last project that we are finishing is a portal that will document the activity, the poetic activities of Puerto Rican writers. It is a virtual space that will offer poems that circulated at some time and many of them are not circulating anymore. So we will provide the original poem and the translation with the biography of the authors. And I will finish now by reiterating our objective, which will be to build a bridge between the past and the present that allows us to think about a future where the Latino community in the US can enjoy the privilege of feeling subjects inside and outside the country, where their official an unofficial history is uh, reflected, included, and studied in their communities and institutions, as well as official records. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabi. Now we go to Paloma with the last presentation. Hello, good morning. I will share my screen. Today, I would like to, to share with you the project called Indigenous Epistemies of the Borderlands. This is a project that has been created and developed within the framework of the Center of Digital Humanities of the University of Houston. As the panel is proposes and what Dr. Baeza has just told us, methodologically and theoretically, this is framed within these same efforts. And in terms of also the formation and the support and the infrastructure in order to carry out this project. I am going to show a video as I will share the text. So this work, the purpose of the work is to study the indigenous epistemics understood as, as a cosmovision from uh, the groups that inhabited the border territory between Texas and Mexico during the colonial periods. So a digital archive has been created from uh, primary sources and uh, their study will be related to the beliefs and the religions of the native groups that uh, lived in the missions of San Antonio and that were evangelized by Franciscan priests who spoke Spanish during the 18th century. The mobility maps of the uh, Palteco speakers during the colonial period is an essential part of the digital archive because it allows us to make visible the relationship between mobility and the epistemis or indigenous cosmovisions. This project 
wants to have a methodological approach that includes philology, hermeneutics, the history of religions and ethnography in order to prove that mobility in the territory that covers today areas of Acahuila, Nuevo Leguan and Te Texas were part of the cosmovisions of the American native uh, groups that inhabited this cultural region. Today, the Cahuelteca uh, nation is identified as a descendant of the natives that uh, spoke Pahuelteco that lived in the missions of San Antonio during the, during the colonial period. Despite the fact that they are not acknowledged as an official nation by the State Department of the US, the American Indian Assistant to Colonial Missions is an organization whose purpose is to preserve and protect culture and traditions of the Native American tribes and other indigenous groups that lived in the colonial missions of the 18th century. The continuity and presence of Guaultecos today in the Texas territory and also in Mexico, it is a great opportunity to study about the persistence of uh, beliefs, religious beliefs, and therefore the forms of knowledge of these indigenous people. So, the main product of this digital product is to contribute to the understanding of the complexity of cultural processes between the uh, borders of uh, Mexico and, and the US during the colonial period and that they become a tool for research as well as for the impact in political policies for educational purposes and also the study of a cultural regional uh, region from a decolonial point of view. In indigenous epistemes of the borderlands is a digital project that has been supported by the Center of Digital Humanities of the Houston University and also a fund of the Puentes Consortium at Rice University. And one of the main difficulties in the study of uh, religious beliefs of indigenous groups and during this period is the diversity of ethnical denominations that we find in historical documents. The mobility maps and their study in this vast territory speak about the complex cultural assimilation processes that occurred in this region. All of these factors make it difficult to study the forms of knowledge of these American native groups. In order to carry out this project, the starting point is the analysis of primary sources. The, the ones that preserve the Coahuilteca language from a philological perspective. And this is a manual for the administration of sacraments that was created by Bartolome Garcia in 1760 and two local manuscripts that are in the Cervantina Library, which is the confessionary for Indians and also the uh, uh, notebook of the Bajalates Indians. This was developed in San Antonio during, during the 18th uh, century, and this is the corpus of the Coahuilteca language history, which was the one that was used the most for the indigenous people in the Coahuila region up to the San Antonio missions. Alonso de Leon says in the 17th century that only in this part of the Indies, in this part of the world that exists between the boundaries, uh, boundaries of the new Florida and Vizcaya, which is the new kingdom of Leon, it is the only part of the world where there is no knowledge of God. So this perspective that is expressed in this chronicle of the 17th century shows us that the indigenous groups as uh, barbarians that 
all the, even though they don't have good, large kingdoms, they don't have religion. Our understanding of uh, the indigenous groups of this re region is derived from the Swanton study that says that in this region and also in the south of Texas, they found Coahuilteca, Cotonago, Maratino, Solano, Comecrudo, Carancagua, Doncagua, and Paranama. These are all languages. So these languages, according to Swanton and Tapir, can be included into a family that's called Opano Cahuilteca that corresponds to the Bocana family. According to Sapil's hypothesis, the language was divided by, by the entering of the Yucuasteca macro family that left two Ocanas portion in the two coasts of the now ter Mexican territory. So the study of uh, this language in these primary sources allows us to go deeper on uh, the cultural concepts and the regional uh, culture that allows us to identify in the speakers of these languages. So the perspective of ethnohistory allows us to recover the pre-Hispanic historic past uh, using the studies of colonial times. The history of religions based on symbolic anthropology of Clifford Diaz allows us to understand religion as a cultural system. This cultural system, which has a way of conceiving the world and uh, the order of existence. Therefore, in the study of religion, the beliefs of a group allows us to understand this uh, cosmovision. So in these perspectives and stemming from symbolic anthropology and the notion of territory and from the philology of languages, these are the main coordinates for what we did uh, with this project that you just saw in the video and that is available in Arte Publico Press, this file of ethno-historical sources. So we did a research in the Briscoe Center for American History of uh, Texas University in Austin where there is a collection and general archive of the Indies. We selected the boxes which volumes had key terms, for example, Indians, Texas Indians, Indians in Nueva Vizcaya, Franciscans in Nueva Vizcaya, missions, colonization, Francisco de Urbiñola, Alonso de Leon. They, we reviewed the volumes, we selected the documents that illustrated in a significant manner the aspect of the epistemic conquest of the borderlands as representatives and imaginaries of the indigenous groups of the North, the evangelization process and religious acculturation processes, inter-ethnic alliances, and also the tensions of the uh, uh, presidium, which had the military power and the missions that had the educational and epistemic cultural power mainly. So these spaces for westernization that were the missions for the indigenous groups. A database was created, built from the, from the information of this collection of the origin of these documents that came from Mexico or Guadalajara, the year of the creation of the document and uh, also the, each entry in the database had the images and also the transcriptions. The total corpus that was digitalized was uh, 36 volumes, and they came from the 17th and 18th century. The collection itself has a very interesting uh, history that, once, that is in Bristol. In the beginning of the 20th century, a, a, a group of students and academicians of UT led by G Eugene Bolton traveled to Sevilla to the General Archive and also the uh, National Archives of M Mexico City to transcribe uh, documents that talked about the history of the 
the border or the process of expansion of Nueva España, that is to say, the uh, um, viceroy territories towards the north. So here in this collection, we have uh, documents from New Mexico, California, and the wide territory that corresponds now to Texas. What is interesting about this collection is that it has a very important conception of the border studies in the 20th century because there is a selection of the documents that were transcribed. So these documents correspond to the general archive of the Indies. These are not um, uh, transcribed. So by transcribing them and making them available on the site, we are collaborating to make visible on these documents, but there is a hermeneutics of the interpretation of this uh, colonial ethno history that we want to uh, develop. Some of the metadata that you can extract from each document uh, where, we, where we can create visualizations that has to do with an interpretation of uh, the text are the type of text, whether it is a journal, a report, a memorial, if it is an accusation, a list of merits, that is to say types of texts that were from that period. The author, if we have the name, if it's a religious authority or a military authority, we see their posture on topics, for example, evangelization, presidiums, uh, aspect of uh, indigenous cultures, names of peoples and places, descriptions of uh, communities and indigenous groups, and also the descriptions or value judgments of these uh, uh, groups are changing in time. And finally, in the database, we carried out some exercises with Jet GPT in order to extract the metadata. We transcribed this with transcribers automatically. And we did some experiments with DALI and giving them some paragraphs of these documents to see how they created the images. It created the images. Right now, what is available is documents that are edited in the digital archive. They are totally available in full with a prior summary introducing the document and also a preliminary study where you can see the uh, images that have been done, particularly of the mobility maps and the Olmeca uh, leagues which was the first part of the project. And you see images in timelines and uh, story maps. It is important to mention that for me, the main progress of the project is that we have a part of the corpus already edited, but what is not edited and has been automatically transcribed without editing them to be published. These have allowed us to do a textual analysis, analysis through Voyant tools and Con R and also Stylo in order to see the denominations that appear in of these 18 nations in the corpus. And this allowed us to have an infrastructure to localize each document that we have transcribed that is digitalized together with the mention of the Tawilteco speaker. This is a work in process. It is a lengthy progress. We are working with a collection of microfilms of the colonial uh, period using a similar methodology to what was developed in the first phase within the framework of uh, the Information Center of Latin Digital Humanities. There are several students involved in this project and I am going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.